tonight's class, well, shelter. And this is the, the taking a look at all the objectives and the options for shelter. Shelter is a part of self-reliance. Self-reliance being one of those things we talk about all the time. You're either going to make provisions for the future and different things that may happen in our lives, or you'll become a victim. Since we have the choice whether we're going to do that or not, you just choose one. The question is, where does shelter fit into this overall curriculum? The mission always has been and will be to just reach and teach as many people as we can in these various areas and of the great value of having reliable, and a key word here would be reliable, shelter, something that you can count on because it has great value at uh, different times. Well, you take a look at all of the curriculum. There's pages and pages of these classes. This is the shelter list that we will be teaching online. Tonight we're at that 6001, which is the, at the top of the list, this, uh, this overview of the entire area. Understanding that true preparedness is not just about having stuff, but it's what's inside your head, what's inside your heart. And it's realizing that we want to back everything up to and base everything on principles, because that is the key to self-reliance. Not just ownership of a bunch of stuff, but it's understanding how and why things work, what you need, what your true priorities are. When we take a look at these preparedness principles, some of these foundational laws. Now there's more than this eight, but these are the eight that I talk about the most. Um, the foundation uh, law for all of them, I believe, is the law of provident living, spiritual attitude, knowledge, and stuff in that order of priority. Uh, you have the law of stewardship. I think that's why you're here and why I'm here. It is about our authority because we're alive, the responsibility to act since we are alive, but it's the accountability that we're really working to have come out very positive. Uh, you know, the accountability, the results of how we act or don't act will either be fun, enjoyable, uh, you know, uh, rewarding, or they can be very, very painful, even dangerous. The law of the parachute is one of these simple concepts, but instead of falling out of planes now when life happens, when disasters occur, it's about your attitudes, knowledge, skills, and supplies, and those things have to be in place before you need them, and they have to be right, just like the idea of a parachute. The nine core preparedness modules, and each one of these is like a parachute. You cannot eliminate any one of these from the list. Well, these principles that I just touched on for just a very short period of time, you can learn more about them online uh, in the class, which is prepare to survive no matter what. That is the foundation class 1001. It is free online at our website. And there's also available the, in the Self-Reliance series the number one DVD, the foundation, that's available through Safe Harbor. It's a two-hour principle-based uh, DVD that's available. We sell that one at very low cost so that people can afford to get it. You can learn about those. And by the way, all of these uh, nine modules, the 1000 series of classes, all of these will be available for people to view online at any time. Uh, the other classes, as we uh, get them presented, they will rotate into the archive area where members will have unlimited access to them. Well, tonight, obviously, we're talking about number six, which is shelter. And we're going to take a look at the big picture of shelter. That's what 1000, uh, 6001 is all about. There are five areas for shelter self-reliance, and we'll be looking into each one of these and helping you understand the various uh, things that are contained within them and, in them and the information that's in there. Number one is just so, uh, principles about shelters. Then you have movable shelter, and there's a lot of options here. You need to know which ones will really work for you and which ones may not. Uh, if you can't afford to buy one, well, then you make one is what it comes down to. So as far as I'm concerned, you always have an option. If you have an understanding of how and why things work and what your true needs and priorities are, you have options is what it comes down to. You have heating concepts and options we'll be talking about. If you're going to have shelter, it is very nice to have it heated, uh, at least part of the time. Uh, now, if you don't have heat, well, you can still be okay because you're out of the weather. And then we have special sheltering needs and some options there to understand and how critical they are. Well, this number one, this um, shelter principles that we'll be talking about, and the classes that cover that in depth. Each one of these classes is uh, between one to three hours in length. We'll be presenting them here. I'll talk more about those later. When we take a look at shelter and we say, well, what is it? We'll just look it up in the dictionary. Uh, it, it's something that covers or shields from exposure or danger. It's a place of safety, 
a cover from the weather, all of these things would apply to our definition of shelter, to protect us from danger, but a place of safety. And shelter can have many important uh, meanings to us. The role of shelter in provident living is to provide a comfortable, safe, and functional, key word there is functional space, for activities that promote our health and well-being. And shelter does that so very well in uh, many different ways. Some of the key parameters that we're looking at, now we'll refer back to these parameters, although we won't go through them individually, but keep them in mind. Number one, it is the function, the benefits, the features that you're looking for. What is the need that you're needing to fulfill with a shelter in a particular case? There, of course, is different structures and different materials, different ways of, of making these, and depending on the features and benefits and the function, you may choose different materials to use, different ways of building them. You have both fixed and permanent shelters. Uh, you have semi-permanent shelters. There are things that are temporary. Some are very, very temporary, yet important to have. You have ones that are portable. Uh, and then you're always considering cost. Uh, each time you're looking at one of the options, you'll be considering all of these uh, and making the decision about what is it that I really need to have, what is it that I must have, what can I do without. Well, benefits of shelter. It's really it's about coming inside out of the weather and out of the, uh, the climate. One of the tops on that list uh, very often is sleep and rest. Now, you don't have to be inside shelter to sleep and rest quite well, but sometimes you really want to come in, particularly if there's heavy wind. And when I've spent time out on mountaintops and in very, very high winds, uh, the rest is kind of poor when you're outside. It isn't as good. It's a little harder to rest and rest well. If you can get inside of something that's comfortable and isn't being shaken and rattled, boy, you sleep better. Uh, it is about variety. It's about change. Uh, it's wonderful to be outside, and as a matter of fact, if you had to stay inside all the time, you'd love to go outside and vice versa. So variety and change is one of the reasons. It's also a place to change clothing, and I will tell you, I have undressed, when I say undressed, I mean right down to the skivvies, to change clothing right outside in the cold, and sometimes below zero and even with a little bit of wind. Eh, boy, is it nice to have shelter to do some changing of clothing. Safety and protection, not just the climate and the weather but it may be safety and protection from all kinds of things that could in fact cause harm or from people, animals, and those things. Now, animals are not really as big a threat as a lot of people think, but yet there's times when you need to be protected from what might be out there. When we have issues of sickness and when there's well care that's going on, some of the things that you need to do are very difficult to do outside exposed to the weather. So this is where shelter comes in and helps so much. It's also a place for learning and for education. You know, if, if you think of a classroom setting in particular, if you're trying to read a book or take notes, it's really difficult to do that in a 40 mile an hour wind uh, that's blowing snow in your face. So coming inside for a place of education and learning. Also to maintain and repair things uh, where you can, uh, if you will, in the cold, and I think about the cold very often, uh, you can take the mittens off so you can use needle and thread a little bit better. Uh, the shelter is important for that, but also it's a little easier to maintain and work on things if you're in the blazing sun and very high temperatures, shade and getting out of the weather helps a lot. It's a place to have fire for cooking and for light. Fire is one of those things that uh, doesn't work real well out in the wind, so it's a shelter for the fire, for the flame that you may be using to cook with and for lighting. And it is about rest, relaxation for social activities where you can sit, but you know, again, outside in the wind, it's really difficult to have a nice game of, of uh, some card game that you want to have or some board game, you know, the Monopoly money is all being blown away. So there's many benefits to shelter. It's not necessary all the time, but there's times when it's really nice to have. Well, we'll keep those in mind. Now there's two major types of shelters, and you'll probably want to be, plan and be able to utilize both of them. You have the fixed and the immobile shelters, probably you live in one of those right now, and then we have ones that are movable and some that are just very, very portable. Well, permanent fixed shelters. It's an immovable dwelling at a selected location, just like your house. That's my house in the upper left-hand corner there. Now, whether it's an individual dwelling or it's a row house or apartment complex, high-rise or any one of those things, you live someplace most of the time. Most people do. A few people are happen to be very mobile in their motorhomes, and that is their home. 
but for 99% of us, we have some kind of a fixed dwelling we live in. Well, <clears throat> when you take a look at this, and one of the very important things in this area of a dwelling where you live in a fixed dwelling is you have to be prepared for maintenance and repairs. We're talking about all the systems, the, the shell of the house, the weather protection. Uh, we're talking about how you would take care of any of the systems, any of the components within the house that help it to function, and you need to be prepared to do that in a grid-down world. Right? When I talk about grid-down, I simply mean there's no power, transportation, things are not being shipped. What are you going to do? You're on your own. And you've got to be able to do these things as long as you need. Well, we'll talk about this in some of the future classes, so you'll have in mind how you might do that, how you plan for those kinds of things. Now, wherever you live, you do need to be prepared to be okay should you lose power for short periods of time or long periods of time. And in particular, when you lose power, you lose heat in the winter, and you're likely to lose cooling in the summer. Also, what about water? And it's one of these things, in most cases, it's water is actually dependent on electricity flowing to the systems. So are you prepared to deal without that utility? And then sewer. All of this has to go into your thinking because if those things are no longer available and there you are in your fixed shelter and you don't have a way of taking care of them, you have a big problem in a hurry. And that's why in these other classes where we talk about water and, and sewer and waste disposal and how to stay warm, all these things are very, very important. Well, part of your preparation in dealing with fixed shelters and with these rigid ones is that things happen. Things happen all the time. They happen around the world. They don't happen to all of us all the time, but by golly, they do occur. Well, are you prepared to deal with them? Sometimes these events can be very, very uh, earth-shaking, literally, and it can bring things down. And it doesn't just happen in the summer or in mild climates. It can happen in the winter when things are disrupted and your life is disrupted, in which case you're going to have to be someplace else. All kinds of things happen with flood, uh, with a storm surge, these kinds of things that can destroy uh, housing and utilities around you. You have flooding that can occur, and we've seen some very serious flooding this last year, and if you're in the wrong place, uh, you may not have a shelter, or as a house in the upper right-hand corner, you're just literally isolated and cut off. Are you prepared to be okay in a situation like that? Uh, you have to be ready to deal with any number of things. One of the challenges that you'll want to do, and this is, I want to stimulate your thinking in the area, is start analyzing where you live. Do you live in an area that is susceptible to extreme damage, such as a tsunami like this? If you live in one of those areas, you have to be prepared to lose everything, and you must be ready to move out, if you will, go someplace else in just a moment's notice, and you need to have things in another location. Some people may be exposed to volcanic activity that can be very, very damaging. We have wildfires that can occur, even in cities and close to cities, that can just literally ravage whole areas, take out utilities, cause you to be evacuated and do extensive damage, including destroying structures around you. Another thing that's one of those very unpredictable ones is the, the people you know, equation. What happens when people become very stressed? and are very unhappy about their circumstances and they do damage to everything around them. Are you prepared to deal with that? Stay out of the way. Can you be safe? This is all a part of your shelter thinking. Well, is your home built for extreme hazards? Because there's a lot of things that you can in fact prepare for and they can be pretty extreme and if you think ahead, plan and build properly, then you may in fact be able to take care of things like, you know, flood and fire and earthquake and extreme winds, mob attack. Some of these things can be protected up to a certain point, but then there's some you just can't. Uh, if you live in the wrong area at the wrong time, the wrong place, there are some things that there's no amount of uh, reinforcement that's going to make it possible for you to survive, in which case the best thing is to just simply be in a different location, preferably in a different location before something happens or when it's coming at you, you need to be ready to go. So one of the things that you're thinking about is when to stay, when to leave. And this is a very serious and a very life uh, and death kind of a decision because it's all about safety. It's all about the resources that you have, where you are, where you may be going to. And it's about your sustainability. It's all about your survivability. This has to go into your thinking. Uh, and even if you feel that you're extremely secure, this still needs to be a part of your thinking, and we talk about that in some other classes, too, in depth. 
Alternative shelter is needed when you must leave your house. Now, in some cases, you may be able to stay on your property, um, such as where I live. I live in a uh, seismic zone. We don't have earthquakes very commonly, but when they do occur, they tend to be fairly large. Well, the house might be shaken to the ground, but I could stay on the uh, the property here there may be storm damage that could do that and one of the advantages of staying close by is you have access to your resources that you're literally digging out of the house so but you would need some alternate shelter if the home has been damaged extensively also alternate shelter is needed when you must evacuate to another area and what can cause that evacuation would be well just general very severe kind of destruction uh, if there's some kind of a life-threatening danger that's moving toward you, some of those pictures we saw earlier, or there might be contamination in the area that says it's just not safe to remain here and try and live here. Well, <clears throat> shelter locations uh, that you need to be thinking about. And, and in these cases, if it's another location away from you, then you've got to take into account the transportation that it takes to get there. In some cases, there are community-organized shelters. You might be moving in with friends in another area, staying with family. You might have to live in your car or vehicle for a period of time. You can think in terms of basic camping. You can have a planned remote location, or there can be a, a well-planned remote family retreat that you say, hey, when it gets really, really bad, this is where we're going to gather, too. These are all part of your thinking uh, in this area of evacuation. Well, these topics are all covered in these classes, in uh, class 6, uh, 6101, uh, more on the principles and the value in shelter, things that you probably don't think about. In 6201, this is the uh, plan and prepare for the long-term grid down home maintenance, things you should be laying in store and skills you might want to learn to have. And, and by the way, one of the things I want to emphasize is when we go through these classes, there's a tendency for some people to go like, it's, it's too much, I can't learn all of these things. It's not necessarily about you being able to do everything, but it's about understanding what needs to be done so you can be making preparations for you to help other people because you have skills they don't have and vice versa. Somebody may have the skill to help, but they don't have the materials. You need to have some of the materials and tools in hand so that others can help you. This is a part of this thinking, and when we talk about things in the community class, I'll cover that even more. Shelter class 6202. This is the planned retreat that you may have for both now and for in the future. That's the place to go to. And then in 6203, there are shelter options with a different kind of a mindset. If you'll look at things differently, you may be surprised at some of the shelter options that you would have now and in the future. And then in the foundation class, uh, 1120, this is a ready, set, evacuate. This is the decision-making process and the planning process about, you know, when do I stay, when do I bail, when is it time to get out of here, and am I prepared to do that? Okay, shelters that can be moved, and this is one that uh, we spent a lot of time in because there's a lot of options here. Literally dwellings that can be relocated. Now, some are very easy to relocate. Some take a little more work, but they can, in fact, be moved. Uh, so self-reliance uh, number two that we talk about of these fives is these movable shelters, and there's a couple of classes in particular that cover that. You're always keeping in mind these uh, shelter parameters that we talked about before. When we look at movable shelter, kind of classifying them, you can classify them by the ease of moving, of relocation. You have some that are portable, easy to move. Some things are like luggable. You can take them along, but you're not going to be carrying that on your back. And then you have things that are literally truckable. In other words, it takes a major effort to move them, and it's going to take something to haul them in. One of the other classifications for shelters, these movable ones, you have some that are temporary. And realizing that temporary might be from a few days to a number of months, you can have semi-permanent that's for many months or a few years. You have things that might be considered quite permanent. Well, realizing that nothing in this world is ultimately uh, eternally permanent for here, but something that would last a lifetime. Well, everyone wants a tent. When, when you think about movable, portable shelters, people think in terms of a tent. But if you don't have a lot of experience with tents, some of the expectations of lifestyle in a tent can be very, very hard to meet. And this is where getting experience beforehand is so important. Definition of a tent, what is it? By the dictionary, well, 
It's a shelter of fabric supported by poles fastened with cords to stakes driven into the ground. And that's kind of what we think of as, as a tent. And it's a pretty good description of them. <clears throat> now you can have tents that are very portable, compact, lightweight, backpackable. When I talk about backpackable, it's something that's of a reasonable weight that you could put along with other supplies and you'd be able to move it along. They're fairly temporary. They may only hold up for a few weeks for the real cheap ones to a number of months. However, they are easy to move. They can be quick to set up and take down. Uh, the several may be needed, however, do you think about this? You know, you look at the, uh, the the ratings on a tent, if you will, and it says, you know, it's it's a four-man tent. <laughs> it's probably good for two people. Uh, you try to get two people in what's called a two-man tent. You better be really, really good friends. This is where you want to have some experience so that you'll understand, hey, I can live, you know, very compacted like this or no, I just need more space. So I always tell people, you know, whatever it says, cut it in half at least, and that means you're going to need to get more of them. And quality is an absolute must in terms of the durability, and quality usually will translate into the price. Uh, now, sometimes you get some really screaming deals. Here's backpacking tents, some of these very portable ones that are compact. They'll weigh from, uh, you know, about a pound for a tiny little shelter I'll show you later, up to they may be 10, 15, 20 pounds. Uh, they will erect in a variety of shapes uh, and configurations, some of them much more durable than others, based on, again, the quality and the price of them. And these shapes, and in the other class that we do, when we take a look at these shapes, there's advantages and disadvantages to the different structures, uh, the different shapes and different materials that we'll teach you about in depth. Now, lightweight, low-cost tents. When I say low-cost tent, you know, it's the less than $100 tent. It's the tent that's uh, $79.95, $39.95, might be $159.95, $200. When you're taking a look at tents that are in the, the less than $100 to just a few hundred dollars, they have a tendency to not be all that durability. They don't last real long, in particular in driving winds, in variable winds. Uh, they may only good, be good for a few weeks of continuous use. And you have to be prepared. If you have these low-cost tents, you've got to be prepared with tools, the skills, and some of the supplies so you can keep you know, patching and reinforcing and putting things back together. And in some cases, that's a real problem because the cheap poles, when they break, they're awful hard to repair. Professional quality tents. Now, here we're talking about a four season. Four season, that's, you know, summer, fall, winter, spring, something that literally can go through all the seasons of the year. In particular, winter with heavy winds, heavy snow loads. That's a four season mountaineering tent. They are quite durable. Uh, they can be very durable. They can stand for a, a year or more if you keep taking care of them. However, they have a tendency to be quite expensive. They do use lightweight materials and there's an awful lot of labor that goes into the fabrication of them. The, the multiple stitching and the folded seams and all the attach points that are reinforced uh, but that's what makes them uh, stand up versus the, the very cheap tent. So they have a huge amount of labor into them. Uh, and if you can take a look at a four season mountaineering tent when you look at them pound for pound and square foot for square foot they cost much more than what would be a heavyweight, heavy material luggable tent, such as a, a professional quality wall tent that's actually going to be quite large in comparison. Uh, those two tents you see in that picture right there might almost cost about the same. One of them is good for two people. The other one you could probably put ten people in. Uh, they'll both last about the same period of time and cost close to the same amount of money. The construction features you're looking for, and here again, I won't go into them in detail here, but in the future classes, when we look at tent details, I'll tell you exactly what I'm looking for and why. The aluminum poles, the stitching quality, the number of tie points, the tie point and reinforcements and what you're looking for. Once you understand what you're looking for, you can take a look at a tent uh, and a backpack and a lot of things and say, this just is not going to hold up for rigorous use. Or you might look at something that's a really, really good deal if you know what you're looking for, it might be an extraordinary deal. Big grommet, grommet reinforcements are important. You want poles on the outside of the inner weather shield. You have an outer weather shield. It's a double wall tent. And then the fabric quality with a verifiable sun life. It's the ultraviolet radiation that is so hard on these things when they stand up week after week, month after month out in the weather. Okay, now some things that do not work. 
it just they're heavily marketed. There's a whole lot of sales pitch going on about survival shelters with these things and they are well number one the tube tent it's in so many of those 72 hour kits out there and then you have the reflective space blanket thing that's made into a bag I'm just going to tell you don't go there this is not good shelter options uh, you'll be surprised at how bad they are so you want to learn why this is true and there's some resources for you one of them is online uh, that you can go to uh, it's on the Safe Harbor Alliance website. Your 72-hour kit could kill you. Down there where the backpack is, uh, you can just click on that and you will put in your email, send you a key to unlock, and you can listen to that program. The other thing that you can get through Safe Harbor Alliance is the Foundation Class 1220 that's on DVD. That will also take you through why these two things are not good options, why they don't really work. Uh, so learn those things there. I won't take time right here, but I just want you to understand tube tents and space blankets are extremely limited in what they do, and people have the wrong impression about how good they are. Now, tents, let's move up in size, what I would call the luggable. These would be tents that are medium in size to, you know, fairly large. Uh, they can be heavy. At the low end, you know, you may be 40, 50 pounds, right up into 150 pounds or so. They're fairly easy to move, although, you know, it's a two-man job, a lot of cases, to take them down, put them up. They can accommodate a small family, three to eight people. And it, here again, if you get the professional quality, the outfitter quality, uh, the, uh, the, the people that are taking folks into the field professionally, they want a tent they can set up and use many, many seasons for many years, and so they'll invest some serious money in them. That would be the kind that you would be looking for. They will typically be of the wall tent like this, kind of the cabin tent or the wall tent. Uh, and you need to learn what you're looking for in the quality. I'll teach you that in the other classes because some of these things are not that great. Uh, particularly when you get to the lower end of the scale, the fabric is lightweight, the stitching isn't all that great, they're not well reinforced. You want to be able to evaluate them so that you're getting something that will stand up. If you want a shelter you're going to live in for a few months through a variety of seasons, you want to have good, um, you know, you want to know that it's going to stand up. Then you have the truckable tents. <clears throat> These are large to very large. They're very heavy duty. You can consider them to be semi-permanent with maintenance. They can stand for years. They are very heavy, 200 pounds to 1,200 pounds. They're very bulky. You're going to need a truck to move them, and it may be a fairly large truck. They are a challenge to move. It will take multiple people to take them down and set them up. This is not a one or two man job. It takes a crew. They can accommodate whole families, you know, four to 20 people plus, depending on the size of the tents. And if you get into the professional quality, the industrial quality, the military quality, then you'll get the durability. Of course, the price goes up. They can range from the medium and small size right up into quite large structures, even bigger kinds of structures. In a, variety of, in a variety of shapes and configurations. Uh, things that uh, have been traditionally used, the TP, there's a, this is a truckable, luggable uh, kind of a structure. Uh, these can be actually outfitted quite nicely inside as you see here. Uh, and then you can have a very large military tent such as this one. This tent inside, <coughs> this is what it looks like. Uh, lots of room. You could accommodate quite a number of people. Here again, definitely a truckable tent, definitely not a one or two man job to set up. Then we move into the movable structures, into the semi-rigid and rigid. Uh, these can be semi-permanent. They'll stand for years if you take care of them. They can be very heavy, 300 to 1500 pounds. They're quite bulky. You'll need a truck. They can be a challenge to move. It takes multiple people to be able to move them. They can accommodate whole families, four to 20 plus people. Here again, you're looking for the professional quality for the best durability. And they can come in a variety of shapes and structures and different materials, and they can be outfitted quite nicely inside. You can move right up into the, to the yurt. Uh, here, these are movable. They take a fair amount of work depending on how you put them up, but they can be moved, taken down and moved if need be, but they are definitely a semi-permanent to permanent type of structure. You have movable structures of other kinds. Uh, we'll talk about the consumer grade of recreational vehicles. The motorhome, and one thing I'd like to point out in all of these, whether it's a motorhome or a fifth wheel trailer or a trailer that you drag behind campers, pop-ups, 
you need to understand that bigger is not always better. Um, bigger means more space. Uh, bigger might be a little more comfortable to live in, but bigger does not translate into better durability uh, and better movability in the long run, depending on the situation. When you have any one of these structures, particularly if it's not a self-contained motorhome, you're going to have to have something to pull it with, and it needs to be fairly big, particularly if you're trying to move that, that structure along with a lot of supplies that you're wanting to live with. Well, they come in a lot of configurations, different prices, different qualities, and many different features. Uh, from slide outs uh, that you can have to different trailers that can pull behind vehicles, uh, campers that go in pickups, and each one has an advantage. And if you have one and own one, you might want to consider what you're able to do with it, how you would be able to take care of it and move it along. Professional grade mobile shelter. In this case, I'm talking about something that would be a, a range camp. Uh, these things will uh, can be around generationally. Literally, they can be passed on. They are heavy. They're extremely well made uh, when you get the right ones, and their durability is amazing. They can be quite comfortable uh, in terms of the features for bedding and sitting, uh, sleeping, uh, and in this particular one, which is my favorite one, you have something you don't see in a lot of recreational vehicles at all. You've got a wood-burning stove in there, so you're not dependent just on the propane, because when you're out of propane, what do you do? When I talk about durability, and in the class where we go through details, this is one that was actually flipped on its side and rolled up on its type, uh, top over an embankment and uh, it did almost no damage uh, to it. it. Broke a window and there was no damage interior at all. I'll walk you through that one because it's extremely well made. That is my top of the list in terms of what I will want to have for a professional quality, very durable, movable uh, shelter. The classes that will give you great details in that and a lot of information, particularly if you don't have a lot of experience in those areas, is a 6102. This is the specifications and details on different portable shelters. It's about tents and a whole lot more. And then another one, 6211, about tenting tips and techniques. If you're going to be using a tent, uh, and if you haven't lived in one and used one extensively, there's a learning curve. And there's some things you need to be prepared to do. And I'll teach you about those things in that class. Okay, this self-reliance for shelters number three. Can't buy one? Well, then make one. You always, 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 as far as I'm concerned, have options. Many, many options. Well, there's two classes in particular we talk about these. Always keeping in mind these parameters that we were looking at. And you can say, ah, tight budget. I don't have a lot of money. You still have many options. And, of course, the message is this. You always do the best you can with what you have, and you can always move up from there. Now, if you're going to do it yourself, DIY, you need some tools and materials, and you need a few skills. And in some cases, you may be able to scrounge a lot of materials. Um, <clears throat> went up in the hills uh, away from my house, got some logs, if you will, some poles, brought them back. That's what they look like. Tools down there at the bottom, these materials, I'm going to construct a shelter from that. You know how to put these tools to work how to utilize them, uh, and I'll walk you through some of those skills. You make the poles that you need. Make some stakes. Uh, you have the rope. You have the twine. Uh, learn a little bit of lashing, a little bit of knot tying, and those kinds of things. Staking and erect this frame, and then you can cover it with some kind of a membrane. You know, tarps and plastic are things that you really need in your supplies. We'll talk about that in this class in particular, the kinds of things that you'd want to have. You can make things is the bottom line. <clears throat> There are other materials that you can use, even PVC pipe and things like that. Uh, Three-quarter inch, one-inch pipe in this case that's uh, attached via bucket lids and wire. Uh, in this case with four-inch PVC pipe with holes drilled in it as the connector so you can build one of these geodesic domes. Geodesic domes are very, very strong and then you put a membrane, a covering over top of them. You can have the very low-cost micro shelter. Here again, this is the idea. You do the best with what you have. You you're, you're just start from where you are. And you don't say, well, I can't afford to buy one of those professional range camps. I guess I just don't have movable shelter. Well, I don't have one of those movable range camps yet. It's one of my goals. I hope to. But if I never do, it's fine because I'll build something, make something, and you can use this. In some of these classes, I talk about it a great deal. That's the plastic sheet. Now, it's not a big shelter. 
but it is the shelter for your bed and for sleeping outside and we've done this for years since the early 60s uh, and right up into today in all kinds of environments in that uh, DVD part two clothing that's in the self-reliant series I'll show you in there we show you in depth how to fold that how to utilize it because once you know how to do that that will take you through extreme conditions very very well and I hear people talk about all the trouble they have with plastic sheets it's just because they don't know how to use it you know how to use it you'll be amazed what you can do with it and of course you can sleep out in very extreme conditions you can take that same concept instead of using plastic something that would be a little more durable and in some ways easier to work with and that would be a fabric in this case and do the same thing of how you wrap up your bed <clears throat> or you can take the fabric and sew it into a bivy sack to make a little shelter that your bed goes inside of and you can stay right outside uh, in that little micro shelter so you have options is the bottom line now emergency shelters and in this case, we're talking about the vehicle. And sometimes you get caught in your vehicle. One of the things that's extremely important to understand is carbon monoxide poisoning is a very serious threat. You need to understand how to properly utilize that vehicle, how to watch out for that, how to position it properly so that you're not likely to be picking up too much of the exhaust fumes. One of the advantages of the shelter, if you will, the vehicle is that you're out of the wind, you're out of the precipitation. Um, you... Um, you, but you're not well insulated. These things are not very well insulated, and uh, they're cold. Bottom line is, when you uh, get inside of these uh, shelters uh, like this, they're very, or stay inside of them, they're just really, really cold. You're better off outside if you're prepared to stay outside, literally getting out in the snow uh, and wrapping your bed in a plastic sheet and burying it in the snow is a heck of a lot warmer than inside of one of those vehicles, particularly when it gets to be very, very cold. Staying with a vehicle is important because it can be more easily spotted and seen uh, than, uh, you know, you on foot. Uh, however, they're really, really cramped, particularly if you have a lot of people. So, <clears throat> but, but it is a shelter. It is an emergency shelter, and you need to be prepared mentally and hopefully physically to deal with those things. And this is one of those trips where, you know, caught out in the, the storm and the closed roads and couldn't go any further. The Jeep, uh, you know, is a temporary shelter until you can get outside and take care of things. I actually spent one night, the first night in the, the Jeep, because it's the middle of the night, and it's difficult to work out in there in the screaming blizzard. And then the next day after the blizzard had calmed down, then you can go outside and take care of setting up a little camp and be just fine out there. Again, this is a mental attitude as much as anything. You have naturally occurring materials. <clears throat> where you use tools to form and shape and modify and maybe things like grasses and reeds and wood snow rock soil all these kinds of things there's options that you may want to be prepared with uh, now most of us don't live where we have the uh, kinds of grasses and reeds that we can make thatched roofs uh, but if you find yourself in that location it works very well and there's many places that they still live like that rock of course log uh, has been traditionally used in uh, building structures and you may want to learn how to do those things. Another one is stabilizing earth. The earth is actually a pretty nice building material but you have to have a way of holding it together. One of the simplest ways of doing that is with what we call sandbags. Uh, these very durable um, plastic bags that used to be made out of canvas but now they're out of plastic that you can fill with earth, with soil, with sand and then when you understand the methods of building you can build structures with them that uh, you can even use now as a root cellar or it can be an emergency shelter in the case of the sandbags they have to be protected on the outside because the ultraviolet radiation will rot them so here is this structure you see going up here when it is now finished and it would be a place really out of the weather out of the wind and one of the great things about a shelter like this is it doesn't flap in the breeze and in the wind Tents can be terribly noisy to sleep in at times. There's a thing called super adobe. It's very similar to the, um, the sandbags, but in this case it's a long tube that is filled with earth and laid up in courses like this. And you have to build everything basically in curved shapes, but you can build structures like this, plaster them, cover them on the outside. If it's an emergency, cover it with mud. See, you have the soupy adobe material. Let's go back here to where the roll of it is. There's a roll of it. That roll is very small.
compared to the structure that you're building because you're taking the soil from the area and filling those bags and then stacking them up. Now this is not something you're going to put up in an afternoon, take down the next day and move, but if you need to move to another location, it's an option. It would work very well and boy are they quiet inside, really, really quiet and very comfortable. Now, some materials are free. What this takes is a little bit of skill and understanding and then the right tools. One of those free materials happens to be the snow. That's one of my favorite ones I'm working with is building different snow structures. The Kind of the most eloquent one of all being the igloo. Uh, and they're wonderful structures to live in and play with uh, and enjoy out in that environment. Uh, understanding how they're constructed, not as a like a course of blocks like you're setting up bricks, but it's literally in one continuous spiral. It's one of the things we teach people in our advanced snow college classes. You put a lantern inside, they look like that as they glow at night. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to be around, very, very enjoyable. The thing that's more common for people to build, the easy thing to build, these little snow houses that's very much like a pup tent. Just get to the right kind of snow, understand what you're looking for, have the right tool. It's called a wood saw. And you can just saw these blocks and put them up. And you have this wonderful little shelter. It is small. You can build it big enough for two people. Uh, and you can link them together in spokes. That makes them kind of fun. Uh, but it's very, very sound, very stable, very quiet, and very comfortable in extreme conditions. And of course you can use snow such as we've done here just to build a little bit of a windbreak around our kitchen and dining room area at one of our camps. We have, of course, naturally occurring structures, caves, thick brush, dense forest, and the topography of the land itself that you can use temporarily as it is. In the case of caves, that's the one that we would most normally think of as actually being a fairly decent shelter to get you out of the wind and out of the weather. And of course, some of the civilizations that are built in, in the West, in our area here and other places around the world, have used these caves as a place to then build their houses inside of because they're wonderfully protected, uh, very stable, and very safe. Well, a couple of classes in particular we talk about these things in 6203. And that's where you have shelter options from a different mindset. Uh, in some cases, to open your understanding about what you might be looking for and what you can do. And then the class 6210, which is you can't afford a portable shelter, then make one. And walk through more de in depth about how to do that. Take a look at this self-reliance in shelters, number four. Shelter heating concepts that you need to understand. <coughs> There's five classes that uh, cover this area in particular. We're always looking at these uh, key parameter, uh, key shelter parameters, uh, some of the benefits that we're after. How about propane heating without electricity? Uh, very often we have furnaces and things like that that require electricity to run them. Well, let's have things that don't take any electricity at all. Uh, propane. It can be open flames. It can be the radiant heaters. And some of the radiant ones, like that one in the upper right-hand corner that I had down in my, in my basement, can be used quite safely indoors if you obey the rules. Um, and they, the, one of their great advantages is that it radiates heat at great distance. Those other two on the left over there are the same kind of a thing. You can feel heat radiating, radiating off from them, you know, 15 feet away, which is really, really nice. Uh, you can use some of the open flame. Now, all of these dump the heat right into the uh, into the room that you're trying to heat, but you have to be very careful. They're consuming oxygen. And the right kind of stoves, the right kind of appliances are just generating water vapor and carbon dioxide. And that means that you've got to be replacing the oxygen. Uh, the wrong kind of appliance, the wrong kind of flame, and not paying close attention, you end up with carbon monoxide, and that's deadly. So you've got to be careful with these things, but they can work very, very well. Ventilation is one of the key things. You also have <clears throat> wood heating without electricity, and there's a variety of appliances. Some of them, you know, very traditional in look, some of them very contemporary, but the wood-burning stoves and fireplaces, as long as you have the biomass, the wood and other materials, then you can use them to heat with. <clears throat> and here again is that range camp that has the wood-burning stove inside, so you're not just dependent on propane. <clears throat> I think it's a good idea 
to have different appliances that we use different fuels because hey as long as you have propane that's the greatest thing to use but when you run out of propane you need a backup kerosene has its place also as long as you have it you have other fuels that of course you can use too we have wood or coal heating without electricity here again if you have access to coal and coal has some great advantages it's a little dirty and a little smelly uh, but it has a lot of heat in it uh, and it banks very well and holds very well through the night but you've got to have the right appliance a wood burning stove that's for wood if you burn coal in it you're going to do damage is the bottom line so it has to be constructed properly it has to be set up to be able to burn coal in it now if it'll burn coal by the way it'll also burn wood a proper chimney if you're going to be doing one of these appliances installing it yourself or having it installed it's extremely important that you have the right kind of chimney and you can put a wood burning stove or a coal burning stove in a tent as long as you have what's called a tent jack which is an insulated uh, fitting that goes through the wall of the tent through the roof of the tent so you <laughs> don't melt the tent you want to have the double wall and triple wall and insulated pipes and those kinds of things whether it's in a tent or whether it's in a house so be sure that you do that right. Don't just throw up any old thing because you can find yourself burning down your shelter and then you've got a really big problem. Sun for heating is one of the things to consider. And, and sun's a wonderful thing to utilize uh, for your warming of your shelters. You can use it for both heating. It can be used for growing food. And it's just a delight to be out in the middle of the winter. We have these freestanding ones like this uh, in my neighborhood or one that I put up in my backyard that allowed me to be harvesting beets and carrots uh, into the winter. But the best way to construct them is where they're attached to the house. They can either be a retrofit to the home, such as this one, and there's an interior view, or this one here. These are all add-ons that uh, were done a number of years ago, inside view right there. Here's another one that was added on to a home. They can be very simple, fairly modest in cost. Uh, and uh, be a wonderful addition or you can design a house such as this one that's designed right around the sun space and it's integrated right into it there you see the interior view taken at the same time in the winter with all of the very tropical and cactus plants growing inside <clears throat> and there's other alternative methods of constructing such as this one and here again is an interior view of the home so they can have a variety of shapes uh, in structures and materials and different styles and designs to them. This is worth considering both as a retrofit or if you would be constructing a new home, you may want to just plug some of those things in so you don't have as much dependent on the utilities. Well, classes that will help you with this, 6103, shelter heating options, <coughs> shelter heating options and true performance. And one of the things, if you haven't heated with wood or propane or solar or those kinds of things, and you're just used to being attached to a thermostat, it's going to be a different life, lifestyle, and you need to understand that and be prepared with that. So some of it's mindset, but it helps with the mindset if you understand what you can really expect to get out of one of these other appliances or other methods. Class 6250, practical options for heating with solar energy. You've seen some of the pictures that are from that class, and there's a bunch more. And there's design ideas that I would uh, give you in those classes. Uh, shelter class 6350, low cost do it yourself attached sun space, greenhouse for heat, food, and fun. We did one of these here just a few weeks back and built one or a portion of one in the class, and that has been recorded. That'll be available in the future. Shelter class 6351, the best greenhouse designs for extending the growing season. And then supplies class. 9109 which is fuels for grid down living you need to understand fuels and both the safety and performance what you can expect from them and the variety of fuels that you would want to have shelter self-reliance number five special sheltering needs and some of the options well shelter class 6104 6204 is where you more depth in those things all the time looking at these benefits and parameters and of course one that I talk about regularly is it's about your clothing I mean that's your personal portable shelter but you do want something to come inside of that's why we build igloos and snow houses and why you have tents and other structures to get inside of here's the ultimate uh, Jim Lovell uh, individual that I've worked with his spacesuit now that was shelter very personal and very necessary or the original spacesuit of sorts was what the old Eskimo wore when he was in that extreme environment of the uh, Arctic and how he lived out there both of those spacesuits took care of those people they were personal portable shelter but some other things to consider the root cellar 
the cold storage space, <clears throat> both for live food and for foods that are uh, have been preserved and you want to store for long periods of time. Well, root cellars have been around a long time. <clears throat> it's the original refrigeration, if you will, the original cooling. That old one is in that upper left-hand corner. Newer ones that you see in these other pictures. Build them inside of your house. Here's a variety of entrances to them. Uh, that one <clears throat> with the brick arch, that was built, if I remember uh, reading on that, that was like uh, 1918, I think, when that was built, or 1880, one or the other. Uh, they've been around for a long time. They'll stand for many, many years. You probably, as a part of your preparedness, want to consider having some kind of a root cellar, whether it's a very small uh, little room, such as the one on the lower right-hand corner, or an area basement in your home, or a dugout outside, or it might be something quite large. It's a great way to extend the life of your carrots and rutabagas and celery and beets and all those kinds of things and your squash and pumpkins as well as things you've canned and put up. Another shelter, I call it the underground arc. <clears throat> Here we're talking about protection and what we call be nice. That is biological, explosive, nuclear, incendiary, uh, chemical, and earthquake protection. The underground arc gives you the best protection in those situations. Uh, they come in a variety of, I'll say, shapes and sizes and constructions. The Probably the lowest cost one is built using corrugated pipe, large corrugated pipe that can be buried in the ground with an entrance, and they're quite comfortable having toured and been around a number of those. Uh, they're amazing. Uh, and uh, when they're properly built and properly outfitted, you'll find it to be very comfortable. And you can uh, get out of the way of some really nasty, ugly stuff and live quite comfortably uh, in them. <clears throat> well, you can learn about some of those things in other books. We talk about that in the library area. Uh, there's another special need which is inside of your house. Special needs that you have to divide off an area in the home. <clears throat> One of the very important uses to understand, and this we talk about more in the wellness area, is you may have people that are very sick and you need to treat them. Uh, they may need to have an area that's both isolated to prevent from spreading, you know, that virus or that bacteria. They may also need to have a place that's extra warm or extra cool. And you can't afford to do that for the entire house. And so you take an area, build a little shelter, as we did here in our house in the bedroom, when we had some very special needs for some treatment in the past, so that we could <clears throat> control that environment. <clears throat> and so you may want to understand that to have the materials, how, when, and where to do those kinds of things, because it'll make all the difference in the era, in the world. And I'll talk about that in one of our wellness classes in particular. Well, shelter class 6104, special purpose sheltering needs and options and 6204 shelter options for be nice and other extreme kinds of conditions. Well, the role of shelter in provident living, and as you've seen in this potpourri of things, it is to provide a comfortable, safe, and functional space for activities that promote health and well-being. These classes that I've given you and talked about right here will, of course, teach them both online. They'll be available on DVD. Uh, they are in various stages of production right now in planning. You'll see them all right here. Watch for them. Well, you live providently. Yeah, the choice is yours. And it's by making proper provisions in all areas of your life that you will have the ability to face the future with hope, with confidence, not with fear and trepidation and, and worry about these things because, you know, the truth about life is this. There's no doubt that tomorrow will come and there's no dispute that things happen. But how you're prepared to meet tomorrow will make all the difference in the world. If you're prepared for the worst, then no matter what happens, it will be an adventure. And I would sure rather have an adventure than a tragedy is what it comes down to. Well, as mentioned all along and always, true preparedness is based on principles. It's not just about getting a bunch of stuff. It's about what's inside your head and your heart, and that's why I like to spend time teaching you how and why things work. And even in an overview class like this, it give you an idea of the different areas you may want to explore. Does everybody have to do everything and know everything? No, that's why we build community. In the near future, watch for the community class because that's an extremely important kind of attitude that you need to have about building community. 
So preparedness is a lifestyle. It's called provident living. It's where you test and try and have fun and play with and experiment and those kinds of things. I encourage you to do that. If you have a, if you want a tent and you think a tent is an answer for you <clears throat> and you haven't lived in a tent for day after day after day, you better get one and live in it. Not to say that you're not going to want a tent then. It's just to simply say you'll understand how to do this, what you need to do, why you need to do things. It'll help you also understand about putting one of these rascals up and taking it down, the kind of quality and things. So it's about experimenting with all of these things. If you want to build structures, learn how to build them. You play with these things now. Well, as always, I encourage you to go do strange things. I do strange things periodically because I'm curious. And I also don't believe anybody has the right to teach something they haven't done. So I play with these things, and I encourage you to play with them also. The ball is in your court, as always. We will be here doing our best to teach you and share with you all the information we can. I have a variety of other people that are, have been teaching classes. We'll teach more. We'll start having some of these other instructors on our Wednesday night programs also. Each uh, Tuesday for the Tuesday night audio cast, uh, one of my favorite things to do, because I get to interview these people and let them teach. <coughs> Every Wednesday night we will be here online. And uh, except when we have connectivity issues, the plan is to be at Cabela's Broadcasting Live. And with more experience and time and working the bugs out, things become more reliable. Register for the newsletter. Uh, you'll see a variety of new things coming in the future. And join us at safeharboralliance.com so that you can both get information and classes. Uh, the calendar that's uh, going up, we will have classes well in advance. Well, I'll open up for questions now, any that you may have. Uh, where does one get those tubes for filling and constructing with? You're talking about the Super Adobe. What you can do, you can just go online, uh, and if you will just Google Super Adobe, uh, there's instructions, there's books, there's videos. You can even go to workshops on those things, and they have that material <coughs> there. Literally what it is, it's sandbag material that hasn't been cut and sewn in the bags. It's just a continuous tube that they're made from. Uh, and those people have very cleverly figured out how to put up a structure. That reminds me a lot of an igloo. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm surprised. That, well, because of they're putting in windows and doors and things, it's a little difficult to do what we would do with an igloo. But you could literally use the same spiral construction you use with an igloo. But in that case, as you saw in the picture, they're just laying up a course of the tubes around there. You can form them over arches and doorways. And once it's all tied together, and the, and the thing that helps to tie those bags together is they're using barbed wire laid down between them so the barbs will stick in between the sacks in there so they don't slide around. So you have a couple, depending on the, the width of the bags, you may have a couple of uh, strands of barbed wire. And it can be used barbed wire. It doesn't have to be new. Uh, barbed wire that's laid down to help hold it together. Uh, they're tamped together very tightly, and because it's a curved shape that's kind of stepped in in there, it literally becomes a shell structure. It's a self-supporting shell. The outsides of them then need to be plastered. They will typically plaster them with, uh, uh, again, running some spikes into the bags, and then you can have chicken wire or lath wire over top of that. Uh, and a mortar plaster mix would be the best thing to use. But if it's an emergency and you don't have any other thing, you just plaster it with mud. Uh, good old clay would be great. Um, you can pile earth up over top of it, like you saw in that one a sandbag construction um, picture that I had. You do need to protect that outer surface from the sun. Now, it could be painted. In some cases, they've been painted. Uh, they um, will put on a... Uh, a whitewash or any number of things so that the ultraviolet radiation does not damage the bags. The plastic will eventually break down. But it's a nice way of constructing. And if you didn't want something too big, you can have a roll of that material and build something that would be larger than a smaller, medium-sized tent, yet uh, it would be uh, very durable, uh, semi-permanent in the sense that it will stand for years as long as you don't uh, damage those bags. It's, it's a really nice construction, and to be inside of one of them, uh, inside of earth construction like that, uh, they're extremely quiet, and um, they, they just feel stable. They feel comfortable. The other thing is, <clears throat> if you build it with thick earth, I, and I lived a lot in adobe houses, which is a similar kind of thing, and I, I love adobe. You have a 16 or an 18-inch uh, thick wall of adobe, uh, very quiet. Uh, very, uh, very comfortable, 
uh, and also it's well insulated in that they will, even without a lot of insulation on them or no insulation on the outside as the old ones were built, they're warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Uh, they are uh, just enjoyable. So my greatest experience, most of my experience, has been with Adobe construction, having helped build them and then live in them through the years. <coughs> so just uh, Google Super Adobe and you will find that material right there. One of the things I've been doing as a part of uh, now formalizing things is getting the class structure down uh, and uh, getting the relationships between classes set so that we can be publishing these things and uh, helping people learn the variety of things that would be nice to understand and have at your fingertips. And again, I encourage you to please, you, you look at this stuff sometimes, people are fairly new to it, and it's like, oh, it's just so much. I can't do all that. Please understand, you don't have to do all of it. I can't do all of it. Um, I am um, interdependent with other people in my community they have skills and abilities that, in areas that I don't have. Maybe someday I will, but you know, it's difficult to know and be able to do everything. That's the way it's always been within families and within communities. We work together because somebody may be the extraordinary gardener. Uh, somebody else has all the skill with the animals. Um, and, and that's where we work together. That's where we trade. That's where we support each other. Somebody else has the mechanic skills. Somebody else has the, the sewing skills and those kinds of things they excel in. So don't get the idea that you have to know it all and do it all, but it's good to be exposed to the different areas you know, where you find an area that you say, hey, that's, that's, I'm good at that. I can really do that. And if it's something that other people are going to need, uh, then you want to be sure that you have the tools and materials and understanding because they're going to have something that you need. And we will be... Uh, exchanging things, trading things, supporting and helping each other. That's what this is all about. So anyway, uh, we will provide to you the uh, the whole potpourri of many of the things you need to know. By the way, there's a lot of things I will probably never teach that might be good to learn and there's other people that will be teaching those things. But as you can see, there's a pretty long list of classes that I know need to be taught and things that I have expert expertise in that I will be sharing with you in all of these areas. Well, if there's no other questions now, we're uh, beyond our uh, 7.30 mark. Uh, it's been a pleasure visiting with you again and sharing some ideas with you. This is Jim Phillips, hoping you have a great evening. I will see you next week. Good night.